One of our mantras here at Trace is you can't hide and heal at the same time. And one of the things I've loved about this series called The Story is we highlight some real life situations that Jesus really helped people overcome. Anna, I am super, super proud of you wherever you're at this morning. And we're honored that you would have felt like you could share your story with us. Anna's story reminds me, I want you to listen to this, Trace. Anna's story reminds me of this uh, irrefutable, self-evident truth. Here you go. Jesus is the answer to whatever you are facing in life today. Jesus is the answer. When there is no hope, you can find hope in Jesus Christ. And everything I'm gonna teach you today is related to that idea. And look, you guys, my prayer has been that, that even though I'm gonna remind you of a lot of truths, I pray you already know that these will fall on your ears like fresh information. Um, I'm Dr. T, I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Trace. Today is the 21st lesson in our 32 week uh, sermon series called The Story. If you've been following along, what you know is that we've been tracing the major themes and stories over the course of the Bible. And we've been looking at ways that those stories impact our story in our day-to-day -day lives right now, right here in 2024. And I thought Aaron did a great job talking about the history of the Israelite people up to this point. Let me give you some background. Where we, were, where we are at right now in the story, if you've been following along, is Nehemiah has led a group of God's people back to Jerusalem. That's the last group to go, all right? Before Nehemiah, let me give you a history lesson. So if you're taking notes, I'm gonna give you some dates and some names I want you to write down. The first group of people led back. So the Babylonians uh, overcome Israel. They take everybody captive. They send them to Babylon. That's like 586 BC. Then the Persians defeat the Babylonians. It's like every people group keeps getting defeated and crazy stuff keeps happening. So the Persians defeat the Babylonians. They're like, who are these people that the Babylons have carried away from this place called Israel? Like we're gonna let some of them go back. So Cyrus, king of Persia, writes a decree and tells a guy named Zerubbabel, you can take some of your people back to the land that you guys came from. And so Zerubbabel in 538 BC takes a group of people back and trace his goal was to rebuild the temple of God. So Zerubbabel builds the temple. It takes him about 20 years from the time he gets back and he finishes the temple in about 516 BC. And so as the numbers decrease, we get closer to the birth of Christ. Um, and, and Zerubbabel's story is found in Ezra, the first six chapters of the book of Ezra. The second guy to lead people back to the promised land is Ezra. And um, Ezra's goal, Zerubbabel's was to build the temple. Ezra's goal was to restore religious purity to God's people. And that happens about 458 BC, about 70 years after the temple is rebuilt. Really important verse from Ezra's uh, time leading God's people and restoring religious purity is Ezra chapter seven and verse 10. The Bible says, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. That's exactly what he did. And he did that under the leadership of another king of Persia named Artaxerxes. Third guy to lead God's people back to the land of prophet, uh, promise was Nehemiah. And Artaxerxes was still king of Persia. Nehemiah had worked his way up into this really honorable role as, Neo, as Artaxerxes' cupbearer. And he would drink everything before Artaxerxes would drink it. They were like trusted friends. And one day Nehemiah was like, hey, Artaxerxes, let me go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. That was Nehemiah's purpose, to fortify the walls of Jerusalem. Artaxerxes is like, go for it. So Nehemiah leads a group of people back to Israel and then they enter into what's called the intertestamental period. And that's about a 400 year span of time where God's people don't really hear from God. And I think it's a time in Israel's history, we might say is equal to the time in your life between high school and college, right? That's that time in life where you like don't know who you are, right? And you don't know what direction you're headed in life. And you feel controlled by all these oppressive forces like my parents and the government and you know, the police. That's kind of where Israel was. They were back in the promised land 
but they didn't have a prophet. They hadn't been hearing from God. They didn't have a good sense of their identity. And because they didn't, hadn't heard from God in a long time, they didn't have a good sense of direction. And they were controlled by people group after people group after people group. So it was the Persians at first, and then this hip young ruler that's like a really incredible warrior from, from Greece named Alexander the Great in about 338 BC overthrows the Persians. And he wants to like in, infuse every people group with Greek culture and that begins the Hellenistic age, which is about 300 years before Jesus. And slowly but surely, the Romans started overthrowing like different provinces of, of Greek rule. And eventually Rome took over Greece. All right, and, and in about 167 AD, this guy named Judas Maccabeus was a leader in Israel. And he's like, we're gonna get these Romans. And he leads a revolt. This little group of people from Israel leads a revolt against Rome, 167 BC, and they win. Judas Maccabeus and his brothers are called the Maccabees and they begin the Hasmonean dynasty in Israel, All right? And for the next hundred years, there's peace, but then a leader in Israel dies and there's a civil war between two brothers and Rome is in power at this point. And so both the brothers appeal to Rome for help in overthrowing their other brother. And Rome sees this as an opportunity to seize power again. So Rome comes in, decimates the army, installs Roman leadership and names a guy called Herod the Great to be the leader of Israel at this specific moment in time. All right, now this is a problem, Trace. This is a problem, and I'll tell you why. It's a problem in the history of the Israelite kingdom because of the promises God had made to his people, right? And there are three promises God made in the form of covenants that I wanna discuss for you real quick to illustrate the problem in Israel at this specific moment in time in the story. All right, so the first promise God made was to a guy named Abraham and he made it in the form of a covenant and we call it the Abrahamic covenant and that's in Genesis chapter 15. And God told Abraham, I am gonna give you a land forever. I'm gonna give you a place to call home, a location you can call your own, somewhere you can put down roots. And in our culture today, it's hard to understand the significance of the promise of a land forever. But the reason it's significant is because Abraham and his descendants didn't have a land. They were a nomadic people group. And a nomadic lifestyle trace is a lifestyle in perpetual motion, constantly on the move. And so there's lots of transients, there's lots of uncertainty, and there is very little rest. Rest was probably the most precious commodity uh, for Abraham in his nomadic lifestyle. And so when God says, Abraham, I'm promising you a land forever, it was like a wave of peace fell over Abraham and he thought, man, I don't have to keep packing up and running from danger and finding resources and uh, washing, rinsing and repeating that process over and over. We have a place we can call our own. And that's a significant promise. The next promise God makes his people is through a guy named Moses. And this is sometimes called the Mosaic Covenant and it happens in Exodus chapter 19. And in Exodus chapter 19 and verse five, God tells the people by way of Moses, if you will follow my commands fully and you will obey me wholeheartedly, then you will be a treasured possession of mine for the rest of time. And so God gave the people the law and by giving them the law, he selected them as his special chosen people for all time. This is significant because it defined the inherent worth of God's people. It defined their worth. And it gave them a set of moral guidelines that could direct their life. So they had clarity, they had consistency, and they had stability. And the third promise God made to his people was made to a man named David. We've talked about this. This is sometimes called the Davidic covenant. Happens in 2 Samuel 7. These are three really critical covenants over the span of the story of the Bible. 
And to David, God makes a promise that someone from your lineage will be on the throne in Israel forever, a king forever. And most scholars view the covenant God makes with David as a covenant that unites the first two. So think about this. A king has to rule over a specific place, right? A specific land. That's the Abrahamic covenant. And a king also rules over a specific people group. That would be the Mosaic covenant. And so when God says, David, I'm gonna make someone from your lineage a king forever, God is saying, I'm gonna give political and cultural stability to the people I have given land and chosen out of all people groups throughout time. But at the moment God's people are in Israel led back by Nehemiah and then the Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans, they had to be wondering, Trace, who is gonna rise to power and restore to us possession of this land. Who's gonna give us possession of the land? And who is gonna rise to power and set us free from Roman oppression so that we can live as God's people? And maybe most obviously, where is a king of the house and lineage of David who can lead us as a people? You know what the answer to every single one of those issues was, Trace? Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ was the answer to every social, political, economic, and spiritual problem Israel faced in this period of time. Jesus was the answer. He was the Messiah that Israel needed, but I can tell you this, he wasn't the Messiah that they expected. I wanted to cover a couple of things that I think the New Testament teaches about the Messiah that the Israelites were expecting and the Messiah that they got. So we could, we could call this a discussion on the unexpected Messiah, all right? The chosen people of God, Trace, were expecting a conquering king, but they got a baby born in a manger that grew into a humble servant of the broken, the destitute, and the forgotten. The people of God were expected to be granted freedom of Rome through power and military might. Instead, Jesus offered freedom through surrender, the denial of self, and the taking up of a cross. The people of God were, were expecting their deliverer to restore respect in the religious leaders of their day. Instead, Jesus taught and preached respect for sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes. Israel was expecting to, to achieve greatness through control and political power. That was their vision. Instead, Jesus offered greatness through service, humility, love, compassion, and peace. The teachings and example of Jesus turned conventional notions of power and greatness upside down. And he presented a radically different path to significance and fulfillment in life. Truly, Jesus was the answer to every problem Israel faced, but he wasn't the answer they were expecting. And I wanna say it again. Trace, Jesus Christ is the answer to every single problem you're facing. But he's probably not the answer you always want or you always expect. And I don't mean that as a platitude. I really do believe that the person of Jesus Christ is what you're looking for in life. And at this moment, the way God is gonna speak to his people and the way God is gonna set his people free and the way God is gonna give them a land forever and a king forever is by sending his son to live on earth and not establish a dominant physical kingdom but establish an inviting spiritual reality where King Jesus could reign. The birth of Jesus then, Trace, is the singularly most important event 
in history for the Israelites, for Christians, and for everybody else. And there are three things I wanna teach you about the birth of Jesus that will transform your life if you can really receive these from me today. The first thing I wanna teach you is that the birth of Jesus means that you are never alone. In a study published last year by Harvard University, the university was interested in the prevalence rates of loneliness among adults in the United States. They did a big uh, rep, uh, uh, nationally representative sample size survey. And what they found, listen to this, 61% of adults described feelings of overwhelming and chronic loneliness in life, over half. In response to that study, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy published an advisory on what he described as the epidemic of loneliness of our time. And here's what he said in the study, and he was citing some earlier research, that loneliness is as damaging to your health as is obesity or smoking. Now, when I teach on this, people will say, well, Trent, I mean, I sure would love if a friend group just kind of fell into my lap, right? People who wanted to walk with me in life and live alongside me and help me shoulder the burdens of the things I faced in life. But Trace, let me tell you something. That's why the birth of Jesus is so critically significant. Every world religion describes man's quest to seek and find God, but only Christianity describes a God leaving the halls of heaven and coming to earth to seek after you. Matthew was one of the gospel writers and he described this in, in the first chapter of his gospel, verses 22 and 23. Let me read this to you. Matthew says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And let me make that singular trace. It means God with you. Because Jesus lives and because he still lives, you can live a connected life. You can live a life, Trace, where you don't have to feel alone. Every long night that you've ever lived through, Jesus has been there. Every deep valley that you've ever had to walk through, Jesus was there. Every amount of suffering and agony and despair you have experienced in life, Jesus was there. In your hardest moments, he was right by your side. When it feels like no one understands Trace, the birth of Jesus tells us that he does. He knows what it's like to live as a human being and experience life this side of heaven, just like you. That's a mindset and awareness that you have to take responsibility to cultivate. Remind yourself, remind yourself that Jesus is with you in life. Learn to see his presence in the world he created. That's why he created beauty to show you that he's real and to let you know he's in your life. Every good thing he places in your life, develop the mindset that it is from him. It is his favor. Practice sensing Jesus's presence day to day. And you will find, you will find that he is a faithful friend and you are not alone. The birth of Jesus also means that you are loved. You are loved. I'm gonna share with you the purpose of your life. I've been doing counseling for 15 years. That's my day job, Monday through Friday. I've done about 30,000 hours of counseling. I say that from time to time, trying to add some credibility to what I'm about to say. Are you purpose for which you were created in life? You ready for it? Here it is. This is your purpose, to love God and to be loved by God and to love God's people and be loved by God's people. That's it. And that means what you are really looking for in life is the love of Jesus Christ. Humans have some interesting ways of demonstrating love, don't we? The Taj Mahal, you're probably familiar with this, a guy named Shah Jahan. 
in the 1600s, around 1613, built the Taj Mahal as an ode to his beloved who passed away during childbirth. And Valentine's Day, we give gifts, right? The exchange of gifts often represents the love we feel. Valentine's Day, we give chocolates and cards and we give flowers like roses. And I think something embedded in our DNA compels us to give when we love because that's how God demonstrates his love to us. That's how he demonstrated his love to us. Do not, I repeat, do not measure God's love for you by your health. God never promises he's gonna love you by making you healthy in life. That ain't the deal. Don't measure God's love for you by your finances. God never promised financial success as an indicator of his love for you. Do you know how you can measure God's love to you? By what he has given you. And when he sent his son Jesus to the earth, he gave you the best gift that has ever been given. I was working with a gal years ago and I do a lot of marriage counseling. So this idea of love is significant to me. And it was hard for me to like synthesize down exactly what I was thinking here. But, but it came to my mind, a discussion I was having with a gal I was working with. And she said, Trent, my husband does a good job at giving me the world. But I just want to feel like I'm his world. And that hit hard. And I asked her, well, what would it take for him to do that? And she said, I just want to feel like his priority. I want him to give me him. That's what God did when he gave you Jesus. He gave you the best of himself. In John's gospel, this is one of the most familiar verses in Christendom. Chapter three, verse 16, you know this. The Bible says, quote, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The word world and the first part of that sentence is the Greek word cosmos, which is where we get our English word cosmos. And guess who that includes? You. God demonstrates his love by giving us Jesus. But it can be really hard to accept the love of God. One of the tougher things for me to help a person overcome is the difficulty they face in accepting love from another. Let me give you four reasons for that. First, people can feel unworthy or inadequate and feelings of unworthiness and inadequacy can make it hard to receive God's love. We might believe at our very core, we don't deserve unconditional love, but the birth of Jesus says you are loved despite what you believe about yourself. Past trauma can make it hard to accept love. Wounds in your past can create barriers that make it hard to be very receptive of the love of another. The birth of Jesus, Trace, says you're loved no matter what you've been through. Living in a performance-based acceptance mentality, which really accurately describes one of the mindsets of the cultures in we live, might make you feel like you have to earn the love of God. And by nature, each of us have a little bit of an inner critic, which makes us feel like no matter how hard we try, we never quite measure up. And as a result, it can be really hard to receive God's love. The birth of Jesus is not a gift you can earn. And it demonstrates God's love for us despite our performance-based mentality. And accepting love requires vulnerability. And most of us hate the idea of being vulnerable, it's terrifying. And that's because lots of us have experienced rejection or abandonment in life. And when someone comes in our life to love us, we're reminded of that old familiar pain of rejection or abandonment. And we can say to ourselves, you know what? It would be easier not to be loved than to risk the pain of rejection or abandonment all over again. The birth of Jesus says you can trust the love of God despite how you feel. Trace, this has been a big part of what I've been praying about this week. My prayer has been that you can more deeply receive the love of God today than maybe you ever have before. 
I'm praying specifically that the love of God can break through any barriers of feeling unworthy or inadequate in your heart today. I'm praying that the love of God can break through any past trauma or wounds that make it hard for you to accept God's love. I'm praying that the love of God, amen. I'm praying that the love of God would break through any performance-based mentality that you have that says no matter how hard you try, you can't earn the love of God because you can't and he loves you just the same. And I'm hoping that the love of God breaks through any barriers of fear related to being vulnerable that are the result of being abandoned or rejected previously in life. Because God will never reject you or abandon you. Trace, receive God's love today and you can begin living out your purpose in life which is to love God and be loved by God. I want that for you this morning. The last thing the birth of Jesus means is that we can overcome. The birth of Jesus teaches us that you can overcome. One of my favorite sets of the Bible, uh, sets of verses in the Bible found in John chapter one, verses four and five. I got this on the screen for you. The, the, the Bible says this, in him, which is this Jesus we're talking about, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind and that light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. What John is teaching us there is that Jesus is life. You wanna get a light, life, get Jesus. And Jesus's life is the light of all life. It guides us, we can follow it, it's trustworthy. And that light can never be overcome by darkness. Trace, what that means is anything you're facing in life, any darkness you are up against, Jesus can help you overcome. In the 1992 Olympic Games in Barcelona, Spain, British Olympian Derek Redmond was ready to win the gold. Over the last four years, from 1988 to 1992, Redmond had endured eight different surgeries due to injuries that he sustained over the course of his training. And finally... He felt race ready. In his first two heats of the 400 meter race, which was his event, he posted the best times. Redmond stepped into the starting blocks for the 400 meter semifinal with confidence. He came set, the gun went off, and he got out to one of the best starts of his career. Unfortunately, tragedy struck. The race didn't conclude like Derek anticipated. And his father had to come to his aid so that he could finish the race. Let me show you this clip that displays this moment in history. Tom Hammond and Craig Massback back at Olympic Stadium in Barcelona, coming up to the men's 400 meter semifinals. Here are the lane assignments. Steve Lewis in lane three. Top four to Wednesday's final. Steve Lewis in lane three. Roberto Hernandez out quickly in four. Now down the back stretch. Ismael on the left of the screen is running very, very quickly. And inside of Lewis, Sunday Bada of Nigeria. And Derek Redmond of Great Britain has pulled up with an injury. Redmond is out. Derek Redmond, the British record holder and an important member of that British 4x400 four meter relay team as he doesn't want anybody to help him. It'll be Lewis to win in 44.50. Look at this. He's going to try to finish his semifinal race. The British have a certain tradition of running which you have to respect a bizarre finish to this first semi-final in the men's 400 meters Derek Redmond of Great Britain pulled up with an injury halfway down the back stretch he's fighting off those trying to help him to finish the race in his lane And now the pain too much.
swelling throughout Olympic Stadium as Redmond, with assistance this time, approaches the finish line he had wanted so desperately to reach. That is the Olympic, Olympic spirit. spirit. Yeah, you can give that a round of applause. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> it's not a perfect illustration, Trace. But when I envision the way God the Father comes to our aid to help us overcome, that really is what I think it looks like. What did it look like in Redmond's life, man, when he was broken and down? His dad came to his rescue. What did it look like in Anna's life when she was broken down and felt hopeless? Her heavenly father came to her rescue. What can happen in your life today? That same heavenly father can come to your aid. One of the things that I like about this illustration is that it exemplifies the reality. God doesn't promise us we're not gonna sustain injury. We will. God doesn't promise there won't be some moments of humiliation and embarrassment and shortfall. There will. God doesn't say you're never gonna walk with a limp. You're gonna. But he does promise that help will always come in time. I don't know what you're dealing with this morning, Trace, but God intended you to hear today that Jesus is the answer you are looking for and he can help you overcome. I pray that you'll surrender whatever you're battling today over to him. Let's bow. Precious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift you have given us in Jesus. God, it's a gift that says we are never alone. It's a gift that says no matter what, we are loved. And Jesus is a gift that says no matter what, we can overcome. God, I just pray your people's hearts would be moved by that truth as though it's fallen on their ears for the first time. And I ask that hearts are transformed in this moment. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.